please be aware that neither Portal, its guests or listeners are providing financial advice. Hello everybody, my name is Derek Graham. I'm the CEO of Portal Asset Management. And importantly with me today is Mark Witten, CIO and co-founder of Portal Asset Management. Hello, Mark. Hey, Derek, how are you doing? Good indeed. So this will be our second market commentary. And we're looking at the market conditions of May. And a lot happened in May, but this is typical of this industry. There's always a lot happening, Mark. So the market generally went sideways through the month of May. And in fact, it's been going sideways generally since March. What do you think the main causes of this are, Mark? I think at this point in time, Derek, there seems to be a, you know, probably due to the regulatory uncertainty, there seems to be a lack of liquidity. I mean, that volumes have been have been slowing. We saw a sort of spike in volumes towards the end of last year with the FTX debacle. And then we saw a lot of assets being taken off exchange and put into custody, into storage. So January saw a nice bounce and the world started, started you know, the outlook for crypto started improving quite a bit. But then, you know, going into February and March, we we saw once again, unfortunately, you know, regulatory uncertainty rearing its head, particularly in the US. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a, a lack of retail investment, I think, over the past few months. So, you know, whilst in the, you know, our, our initial expectation going into this year was that there would be more institutional investors getting involved. And this was probably a year, a year back. That's what we kind of expected as the cycle started improving. I think we've seen a bit of a pullback from institutions until we have a, you know, more regulatory certainty, and B, uh, I think the, the concern around counterparty risk has been there. So yes. I, I don't think it's anything to do with crypto specifically. I think markets in general have been quite lackluster. I think it's just that we've we've seen we've seen volumes that are quite thin. I think that's the main driver of the mm. sideways movement. So also, of course, we've seen a great deal of noise and action by the chairman of the SEC, Gary Gensler, as he's pursued industry leaders in the US, such as Coinbase and Binance. Now, both of these organizations claim that the regulations in America are unclear and problematic. And at the same time, we're seeing regulations getting established all around the world, Europe, Britain, Brazil, Japan, Singapore, Switzerland. What do you think is happening in this process? And do you think this lack of clarity is going to benefit other countries apart from the USA. Yeah, for the second part first, I do think that's what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing a resurgence of, of activity in China, particularly Hong Kong. They've they've gone towards you know their, their their acceptance of of crypto. We're seeing very solid growth and, and acceptance here in Switzerland, um, Crypto Valley and Zug. You know, the UK has stated their intention of becoming a crypto hub. Dubai is is attracting a lot of, of fund managers and a lot of a lot of wealth. So I think the you know the unfortunate outcome is that the USA is starting to lose its dominance in terms of being you know an early stage adapter and adopter and a pioneer in the spam. You know, most of the the funds that we look at, most of the larger funds, the more established funds, you know, were initially formed and driven out of the out of the US, out of Silicon Valley and and New York, the tri-state area. So I think the lack of regulatory, you know, certainty, but also it, it seems that the the SEC and the Gensler seems to be quite antagonistic towards crypto. They're not sitting and saying, "Well, let's work this out." Mm. You know, it, it's it's quite startling to me that they can't really come to the definition of what is a security, and that they're trying to include stable coins as securities, which means cash as securities, which can kind of turns regulation upside down. So I think this this operation choke point, as they call it, is definitely hurting the brand and the image of the USA as both an innovator and a, a driver of, of investment in the space. And it's it's benefiting their, you know, it's benefiting other countries that are starting to to be comfortable in adopting it. With the, you know, with, with Europe, you know, promulgating and passing the MICA regulation, I think that's starting to give investors like ourselves, as well as fund managers that are committing their, you know, their their time and their their wealth, et cetera, to set up funds and VC, et cetera. They're, they're starting to feel a lot more comfortable and they would be now understand what the boundaries are. And once you know what the rules are, then it's easy for entrepreneurs to continue to compete. But until the rules are certain, particularly in the US, I think we're going to see investors tilt their portfolios away. Um, and I, I think Europe is probably best placed to, to pick up that slack. Yes, very true. What is interesting is that 
you know, the attack on crypto in the US is now called choke point 2.0. So generally the industry considers it to be attack. Yet at the same time, the industry's fear and greed index is sitting at around 53%. In other words, it's neutral, as if the industry is expecting this to happen. What do you think is happening here? I think there's two things that have happened. One is that whoever wanted to sell, you know, the weekends would have been flushed out last year. Yeah. So, you know, if the industry itself was going to break, so to speak, it would have happened in November after the collapse of, of FTX and everyone everyone took their assets, you know, off exchange and, and into and put them generally into to cold storage. So I think that's that that's part of it in that there's there hasn't been any panic selling. We've seen with the latest announcements. There's the people that are holding crypto like ourselves. We we have a long term outlook. We're we're very mm. bullish from a thematic point of view. So I think that's that's number one. I think number two, you know, the world is starting to realize that inflation is no longer a problem. And if inflation is going to fall, if we're going to see you know deflation coming in, then it would not make sense to to sell out of long duration risk assets such as you know growth stocks, crypto, etc. So I think, as the saying goes, you know, you you can't sell to sellers and you you can't buy from buyers. I think the selling's been done, and what what we see now is strong buying coming in. Crypto has been range bound. Bitcoin, in any event, has been range bound. You know, it hasn't really dipped below all at twenty seven, twenty six thousand US. So when it gets there, twenty five, you're seeing you know a lot of buying coming in. So I think that's the main reason for the, the volatility falling is all the big drivers of last year's you know difficult markets such as you know unexpectedly rising very quickly rising interest rates the, the conflicts in the Ukraine some of the the centralized exchanges not being able to meet redemptions and so on and then the the fraud the outright fraud that FTX was those were unknowns but that's that's in the base so you know we haven't had any really big shocks this year outside of Gensler's continuing you know switching his left from his right foot into in, in, into his mouth yes. Hey, Mark, you always say that macroeconomics dominates the microeconomics. You're outlining that real inflation now is down to 2.84% this year, and the possible rates should be falling some 250 basis points. You know, with, with this and the expectation that interest rates are going to be dropping over the next 24 months, what do you think that's going to do for risk assets? So I think that, you know, the Fed, unfortunately, with with their you know their sizable team, has been sort of very much looking in the rearview mirror when it comes to inflation and and acting reflexively instead of proactively. You know some of the inflation measures that we follow and many of the we would say better better serviced some some of the macroeconomic indicators that we follow, but also some of the the news flow that we follow the service providers that we follow have been predicting that inflation is is coming down a lot more rapidly than we initially expected. So what we're seeing now in certain countries, particularly the commodity linked countries like Brazil, to an extent, China, we're seeing defla we're seeing a deflationary environment. So I think, you know, the the market and the Fed seems to be waiting for inflation to fall within their range, but inflation has been steadily falling into that range. And I think going forward, they definitely have a large amount of room to cut and not, not a very strongly defensible position by saying that inflation is the problem. And they've put a lot of stress on bank balance sheets and, and companies. Mm. There's a lot of a lot of corporates that have quite a bit of that would like to issue, you know, quite a bit of quite a bit of debt. So I think what this means for longer term or longer duration assets is it's going to be, I think, very positive as the cost of money comes down in terms of interest rates. I think we'll see a, another risk on environment. I mean, first of all, you have our personal thematic in terms of the the distributed le distributed ledger technology. You know, the convergence of of that, and as well as investor adoption, that's continuing to track along pretty much in line with how we saw adoption of the internet in the late '90s and early 2000s. And then the concern around the U.S. dollar continuing to be debased. That combined with now a massive easing in liquidity conditions, and once again, I think banks will start to to be comfortable as their balance sheets are are shored up. You know, be comfortable with credit extension. I expect we we're going into a, a hopefully hopefully a much stronger second half in 2023, and definitely 2024. The markets are starting to price in. 
I would say probably around 200, 250 basis points of cuts between the third quarter and, and the middle of next year. And that bodes well for risk assets. So both the thematic, as well as the liquidity, as well as the investor adoption, as well as the technological innovation, all of those continue to converge. And I think the outlook is, is very positive. Ooh. Mark, in your monthly commentary, which comes out, well, every month, you've looked back on the month of May and, and you've turned around and acknowledged that the market's been going sideways for some time. But as a fund manager, where are you looking at in regards to leaning into risk and expanding the portfolio a little bit more than we have in the last few months? What are your thoughts on that at the moment? I think, you know, based on the the macro, which, as you say, you know, rightly, that it, it always dominates the micro. I think based on the macro, I think we're, you know, I would like to to add a bit more net long exposure, a bit more risk to to the to the three portfolios, well, the two portfolios that we we actively manage. I think that's it's the right time in terms of where we are in the cycle. If we're going into a rate cutting cycle and we're starting to see some of the tensions, the geopolitical tensions unwind rather than than escalate. Then I would say, you know, we we definitely are the we are, you know all indications tell us that we're at the peak of this of this rate cycle, which means, you know, as this as rates come off, we should see a, you know money moving out of cash, out of money markets, potentially out of fixed income as the yields come off, back into into risk assets. So we're leaning into the risk, not aggressively in this first you know month or two, but by the third quarter of this year, I think we'll be more long than we've been in probably two years. Ooh, interesting. So obviously your outlook is positive in the realm of crypto and digital assets. What particular things do you look at in that over this next two to three year period that you can you know, point to this, that says this is why we're deploying more into this space. We continue to expand the fund. In fact, we have three funds into this space. So I think the the outlook for me at this point in time, given the the difficult period that we've seen over the past few years, beginning in 2020, is cautiously confident. I think, you know, we continue to see, as I said, the adoption by investors. We're seeing more funds come to the market. We're seeing more interest in the space. We're seeing more acceptance of it from an institutional point of view. Regardless of the news flow that we see that is that is negative, if we look at the underlying reality. We continue to see companies roll out infrastructure. We continue to see, you know, banks, you know, starting to build dedicated teams. And we continue to see, you know, people moving from traditional finance into the space. So I think that's definitely, you know, part of why the outlook is, is positive. I think if I look at the thematics, there's there's technology that is very disruptive. Right now, AI is is the kind of the buzzword and everyone's sort of jumping on that bandwagon. But if I look at what I think is going to be the real disruptor, it's not so much AI. I think it's going to be Web three, and I think Web three is is going to you know continue to to, to fire at the incumbents. It's going to continue to to drive innovation in that it gives entrepreneurs the ability to, to basically you know build their own source of income, to own their, their their code, and it gives them a chance of competing. And I think that's the that's going to be one of the main drivers of the growth in that's in that space. You know, gaming, I think, will also be quite a big thematic and so forth. And, you know, this continued debasement of currency combined with the geopolitical uncertainty will, it's, it is it is causing investors to sit up and think, well, where do we where do we want to place our bets? But also, you know, should we not have some exposure to the space? Because if, mm. if history is any guide, then I think where we are, you know, having seen the cycles in, in crypto, particularly driven by Bitcoin over the past few years, then I think we're at the the turning point of of quite a solid you know move upwards a secular move upwards, which you know could easily be a five to ten x event, um, and having a small allocation of of digital assets and crypto in your portfolio, it could be a you know a really welcome boost to to returns, which I think on the equity outlook, to an extent fixed income and, and real estate definitely are not looking very you know not looking very sanguine. Just to put this into a little bit of perspective for the listening audience. Digital assets are capitalized at around $1.1, $1 1 $1.2 trillion in totality, every digital asset. Around 76% of the entire value of digital assets is in the top seven tokens. The estimated size of the fund management industry and banking as of 2020 was sitting at $417 trillion. 
If we went up 10x in this space, we would still be a blip on that total value. It really is a small industry with considerable scope for growth, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, I think I think the better industry to compare it to is is or a better asset class would be gold. And I think gold is mm -hmm. currently call it nearly 12 trillion market cap. Mm -hmm. So we could easily do 10x in this space. Um, and I don't think it's going to be driven completely by the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think there's going to be a lot of sort of newer tokens that are coming to market that are, I believe, you know, that have one of the good things that happens in a market downturn, like we saw when, when, when liquidity is withdrawn, is that a lot of bad projects get culled. A lot of bad tokens get culled. And in the crypto space, there are no bailouts. So it's, you know, if, if, if your business is not up to must, it's unfortunate there, there are no bank bailouts. And because of that, I think what you've seen is a good pruning, which yes. means that a lot of, I believe, better business opportunities are coming through, better teams. You know, the VC space was very healthy in 2020, 2021. And the money that went into that space is not short-term hot money. It's kind of locked in for five to seven years. So the projects that we're starting to hear about and what we see coming down the pipe you know, they're only they're only coming to market, you know, now and in the next 12 to 18 months. And there's, there's you know, obviously stuff behind that as well. So yeah, I think I think we we have a positive outlook for a number of of reasons. But I do believe that the market cap is going to grow not just because of you know the growth or the you know the, the capital appreciation you'll see in the current tokens, because of new and better tokens as well coming to the market, as well as you know, we haven't really seen the application and and what could be built in terms of NFTs, tokenization. There's still so many exciting things coming down the pipe. It's just a question now of of figuring out which jurisdictions are going to enable that and which mm -hmm. jurisdictions, unfortunately, are going to, you know, kind of choke that. Mm, very much so. And this extraordinary time now where you'll see things like the confluence of blockchain, the confluence of blockchain with Web 3.0, artificial intelligence, and digital assets to be able to transact in that environment, you know, the greater of that combination could be extraordinary. And none of that's calculated into any value in this market at the moment. So there's a lot to stay tuned for. Thank you very much, like normal. And let's look together, let's look to get together again in, in July. And let's see how June goes as our month that you do your That's market good. commentary on. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Bye Dave. for now.